My work life as a financial controller revolves around a few things. It mostly all has to do with financial reporting. But in order to get to report on the financial information, I need to go through some operational tasks around tax, audit, accounts payable, etc. In general, my days are very different, meaning that I do different things each day of the month. But unfortunately, the nature of the work also means that I have some sort of repetition that occurs each month. It almost feels like I'm living the same month over and over with some very, very minor plot twists. In this video, I'm going to make an attempt to break down a month in my life as a financial controller rather than focusing on a day in my life. This is because I believe a month is a much better representation of what I have to do to produce monthly financial statements. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. In today's video, I'm going to show you how I split my time working as a financial controller. So we're gonna walk through the different areas of accounting and finance here in this pie chart, and we go through the percentage of time split in each of these areas here, and I'll show you this, which is very relevant to you if you're an accounting student or an accounting professional, and maybe targeting becoming a financial controller in the future. So we'll go through this, and in general, in a company, the CFO is the highest level of authority in finance, right? So the CFO is responsible for the financial well-being of the company, whereas the financial controller is the operational size. So my role is to make sure that everything, everything is running smoothly in terms of billing, accounts payable, payroll, month and close, cash management, audit, tax. So we'll go through all of these areas. I'm not gonna dive in deep in each of these areas. Maybe we'll dedicate in the future some videos in these areas. But today, I wanna just give you a flavor of what I have to do for each of these areas here. And to get a lot of this work done and done on time efficiently, I rely on a very cool and nifty tool called Loom or Loom.com, which was kind enough to sponsor today's video. Loom provides a nifty tool that helps me create demo videos for work. And by using Loom, I'm actually able to skip about 30 to 50% of my weekly meetings, simply because I can record a short two to three minute video using the tool and share it with my teammates in a single link. Loom has over 14 million users and has some really rocking tools like the ability to quickly edit my videos and remove my errors or arms in no time. Loom is actually pretty amazing for accountants as it allows me to show others how to use a feature in the accounting software or explain a complex journal entry. And the best part, get ready for it, it's 100% free and you can get started by clicking in the link in the description below. And before we jump into these topics and talk about each one in detail, I wanna share with you three secrets so that you can get a quick win out of this video. The first one is that you don't have to be an expert in these areas to become a financial controller, right? You just have to have enough exposure. And by enough exposure, I mean one to two years, three years in accounts payable, in billing, in tax. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to work uh, decades in these areas to become a financial controller. Okay, that's secret number one. Secret number two is that you can rely on outside help to help you with these areas. So for example, in tax, I'm not an expert in tax, but I rely on an outside firm to help me prepare the tax return, right? So I, I rely on outside consulting help in some of these areas, for example, payroll. I work, for example, with ADP. So I would rely on ADP directly to give me some guidance on payroll, right? So that's the secret number two. And um, secret number three is that you can still Google stuff, right? So right now as a controller working in finance and accounting for a decade and a half, I still finding myself searching for answers online. I don't know the answer to everything, right? I can search for answers online. So three quick se secrets is that you don't have to get expert in each one. Second, you can rely on outside help. In many cases in tax, in uh, AP, in payroll, you can rely on outside help. And three, you don't have to know all the answers. You can search stuff online, right? This is common place in today's environment. All right, let's begin with the task that takes the most of my time, which is 30% spent on month end closing, which is closing the books and preparing the financial statements. So let's take a quick look at what it takes to get this task done. The goal and purpose of month end close is to generate the financial statements and be comfortable that all of the transactions for the business are correctly represented on the financial statements. And for that to happen, I have a month end checklist that I go through. I have a literal checklist that I go one by one at the end of each period and to make sure that I hit every one of them. And I made a video a while back on that. I'll leave a link to it up here on the checklist that I create for myself to go ahead and close the months. But mainly on the checklist, there are three areas that I usually have to hit. The first one is adjustments. The second is analysis. 
And then third is locking down the period. And so with adjustments, um, an example of that is an accrual. So for example, uh, if a vendor does not send their bill on time, but I know that I incurred the expense, the expense actually took place, then I have to accrue for it, right? So that's an accrual. That's an example of an adjustment that I have to do at month end. And then the second thing that I do is analysis, which means that I analyze, after I get all the transactions in, I analyze month over month, uh, and also uh, actual versus budget. Uh, that gives me a guide that my transactions are already booked. And if I find any irregularities in my flux analysis, then that gives me an idea that there is something that is missing that I need to book. And then finally, once I'm comfortable with all of that, what I mentioned, I'm gonna lock down the period in the accounting software and go ahead and physically go in and lock it so that no more transactions can hit that period. And that's what it means to close the month. All right, going down the list, the next area is gonna be 20% of my time spent on billing. And the reason why billing is so important for a controller is because if you do it wrong, you could be undercharging your customers and then leaving money on the table, or maybe you're overcharging your customers and you could risk upsetting your customers. So let's take a quick look at billing and see what it takes. So billing is crucial for a company because that's how you make money, right? So make sure you have a good system in place for billing, whether it's a continuous billing, meaning that you're billing throughout the months, and this is typical for manufacturing. If you're selling physical goods, you're usually just billing every time you get an order and you ship it, then you issue an invoice. This is continuous billing versus month end billing. If you're doing like a service or a software, that's when you uh, accumulate all of the service that you provide or the software charge at the end of the month and then send one invoice at the end of each month. So just make sure you've configured a good billing process in place to make sure that you're setting up the uh, contract, you're taking the contract with the customer and setting it up correctly uh, as a billing process. Also, it is a really good practice at the end of the month to perform a by customer analysis month over month to figure out if there are any changes or irregularities in the way that customers order so that you can see if you missed anything in your billing process. All right, the next area we're gonna talk about is cash management, and it takes about 15% of my time. And it's more of a strategic task, right? It's more of a forecast and more of an art than it is a science, right? When we talk about a lot of these things here, like billing and accounts payable and payroll, these are more transactional. With cash management, it's more strategic. So let's take a quick look on cash management and elaborate a little bit to understand what we have to do. All right, with cash management, you can expect to be working very closely with your CFO and the rest of the finance team, mainly in three areas. The first one is a short-term cash forecast. The second one is long-term planned capex. And then the third one is an investment policy. So with the first one, with the short-term, you're mainly just making sure in the forecast model that you have enough money coming in from cash receipts from customers to cover your vendor invoices. Uh, the second one is long-term capex. So if you're planning a renovation or buying equipment, or any large purchases, make sure to factor that in the cash forecasting model. And then the third is an investment policy. With an investment policy, this is more relevant if you're fortunate enough as a company to have excess cash on hand. So if you have more money than to know what to do with, uh, an investment policy is really helpful. And I highly recommend it if you don't have one is to go and get one drafted and have it approved by the board of, the board of directors. And so with an investment policy, it just outlines and gets everybody on the same page on to what to do with excess cash, whether you're gonna be conservative maybe and put it in a money market uh, account or maybe more risk taking and put it in equities. But it's, it's good to have one in place, especially if you have excess cash on hand. All right, the next area I spend some time on is gonna be payroll. And I spend about 10% of my time working on payroll. And granted, this function is more of an HR function, human resources, but the controller just makes sure that all of the deductions and benefits are going correctly into payroll and everybody's getting paid on time. The thing about payroll is that people are extremely sensitive to their money, right? So you have to make sure that everybody's getting paid on time and the right amounts, right? So this is your job as a controller, even though the HR team is taking care of inputting the data when a new hire comes in or when somebody exits the company, HR is taking care of all of that, but you just have to monitor and make sure that everything is correct. And so in my case, what I do is a flux analysis period over period. So basically what I do is I take the previous uh, pay period and compare it to the current pay period and see that really what's coming in is either new hires maybe coming in and I compare that to maybe an offer letter to make sure that it's correct, the salary is put in correct, the county and state where they live is correct. And then what's going out is maybe somebody who's terminated and I look at terminations to make sure that this is correct in the payroll, right? And I usually also check for bonuses and commissions to make sure that this is stated correctly on the payroll as well. 
All right, let's talk about accounts payable. Accounts payable takes about 10% of my time as well and kind of goes hand in hand with cash management where I'm always making sure that I have enough money on hand to pay my suppliers. So let's take a quick look on AP and what it takes to get it run smoothly. With accounts payable, it's all about setting up a policy and then making sure that everybody is following that policy so that when someone within the company needs to purchase a service or a product, they know what to do, right? So usually there's a process for it to request a purchase order for them to go out and get a service or product. And then the second part of it is setting up the uh, accounts payable team to understand what they have to do with an invoice that comes in from a vendor that needs to be matched to a purchase order. So we know that this, uh, this spend has been pre-approved right so you do that matching and then you get an approval from the finance team that somebody has to review the final payment before it goes out to make sure that everything has matched up and everything is correct and matches up to the budget which means that all i have to do as a financial controller is set up the policy and put the process in place and only manage the exceptions when there is a problem or a vendor invoice that comes in that doesn't have any po to match to that's when I mostly intervene. But most of what I mean by accounts payable is a policy and a process. And so once you have these two things in place, then you have no problem with accounts payable. All right, let's talk about audit. An audit takes about 10% of my time. And what I mean by audit is an external auditor coming into the company and auditing the financial statements to make sure that they fairly represent the financial condition of the company. So let's take a quick look at what I have to do to get an audit to run efficiently. When it comes to audit, it's worth noting there are two things that are important to me as a financial controller that I get out of an audit. The first one is that I get a set of audited financial statements that we as a company can use in any kind of fundraising or any kind of investor event that we have. The second one is that the auditor, when they come in, they give me a report that shows any kind of deficiencies in my internal controls that can help me then better design my processes and policies across the company. And how does an audit generally work? Well, the way it works is that the auditor comes in and they ask for a list of requirements. And usually this is called provided by client or PPC. And usually what's on that list is gonna be the financial statements, the final income statement and balance sheet for at the end of the period and then also the general ledger for the auditor to take the general ledger, which is the underlying detail behind the financial statements, for, so for them to make a selection out of this general ledger activity, so for me then to provide support and evidence that these transactions are legit and actually took place. I will also work with the auditors on drafting the confirmation letters that will go out to the banks to confirm our cash balances and to our large customers to confirm our larger accounts receivable balances. All right, let's talk about tax and I spend about 5% of my time working in tax. And the one important thing to note here is that I'm not a tax accountant and people are often shocked by this when I say I'm a CPA, but I don't know a whole lot about tax, right? So I just know enough to get by, right? And for that reason, because I'm not a tax accountant, I come more from an audit background and I work, worked in private accounting after that. What I do with tax is that I have to rely on outside firms to help me with the tax return preparation, with the setup of sales tax or any other type of indirect tax. I have to rely on an outside firm and I just need to manage the relationship and know enough about it to keep it going. So let's take a quick look on tax and see what I have to do to get it to work efficiently. When it comes to tax, there are two areas of taxation to talk about when you're a financial controller. The first one is direct tax, and it's called direct because it's directly related to the income from the business. And the second is indirect tax. And indirect, the most famous example is sales tax. Or if you're in the UK or Europe, you call it VAT, value added tax. And so with the uh, income tax, there are three things that I care about, which is the annual filing, and I rely on an outside firm for that. The second is the quarterly estimates. So as a corporation, I have to make quarterly estimates to the IRS and the state governments. And then third is the tax provision, which is what I have to book on my books and records to adjust for any kind of deferred tax assets or deferred, deferred tax liabilities at the end of the period. So this is for the direct tax, which is the income tax. Now for the indirect tax, which is the either sales tax or if you're in Europe or UK, it's VAT or Canada, it's called GST, right? For that, I just need to make sure that my billing is set up correctly and I also rely on outside firms to guide me on what I have to do in terms of which jurisdiction requires me as a seller in that state or in that country to collect the uh, value added tax in that country. And then the second thing is just to set it up in the billing system to get it to run smoothly and add that tax on the invoice. So with taxation, there's direct tax and indirect tax. The direct is directly related to income. 
indirect, which is the kind of value added tax you add on the customer invoice when you send them an invoice for the service and the goods that you're selling them. That's it for today. I really hope you enjoyed the video and learn about my world a little bit more. And if you liked it and you enjoyed the video, give it a big thumbs up. And if you can share it with someone else that you know who might benefit from it, please go ahead and share it. That will be very, very much appreciated by me. And I'll see you in the next video.